Presenter is Meinhard Kissig. Uh, you are talking about FASI RV. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. Welcome to this talk about FASI RV, a RISC V code that scales to your needs. Uh, before we start, I want to briefly introduce myself. It's my first OrConf. It's, I'm glad to be here. I'm a PhD student at Graz University of Technology, and you can see here my main interests, which are FPGA architectures and uh, back-end tools, especially placement and routing tools, but also um, processor architectures and ISA extensions, and to a certain extent, applied form verification. And I want to start this talk with a question that you might have asked yourself when you looked through the program, or you just saw the title now. And this is, do we actually need another RISC-V core? There are so many out there that are open source. We have just seen one, which is great. What is the point? And hopefully, I can convince you what makes uh, FASI RV special and why it's an enhancement to the portfolio of cores that are out there. And for that, we need to take a look at the target, so uh, what we want to achieve with that core. And basically, we target applications where you need little processing power to say maybe moderate, but you have a high focus on area. So area in terms of real area in, F in ASICs or in terms of resources in an FPGA. This may be control-oriented designs, the IoT, or maybe you have a project and you need another core just for debugging purposes on it without eating away too much area. So basically, we want to fulfill the performance requirements with the minimum area demand possible. So let's take a look at some cores. And we take a look at the cores in a reference SOC, so an S a really minimal SOC that implements uh, that core. And you may know uh, SURF, an award-winning uh, bit serial risk five core. And it's also the smallest tier, so it's a bit serial, so you process one bit at a time. But it also gives you just a bit of performance, because when you process one bit at a time, you need to go through all that bits to have the processing done. Then there is Curve, this is the four bit um, brother or sister of Surf, I would say, which processes four bits at a time. And then we, on the other side, have, say, the prevalent RISC-V cores that are a classical implementation. And in between there, uh, you can see a gap. But before that, let's remove the labels and start actually on the other side. So at a very abstract view, you can say, OK, we need some area to get started, to build up the register file, the decoder, everything that we really need. And then, we can add area to get more performance out of the core, so from a very, very abstract view. And you can see between there that we have a gap. Say that a curve does not have enough performance for your application, then you need to make the huge jump over to the next bigger core, made the Pico Risk v made the VEX Risk v but uh, you need to invest more area just to get a bit more performance that you may need for your application. And you can also say there is a uh, smaller gap between them. Uh, we also have a publication on that. Uh, if you're interested, it's, uh, it's open access. So the core itself is uh, open source on the MIT license, but also the publication is freely available if you may not have access to, uh, for, um, by your uh, university to all that IEEE stuff and so. And we want to provide um, variants in between there, so between Curve and the, the next bigger cores that are out there. So let's take a look at our design objectives. We want to have scalability. So we want to implement either a bit serial core that processes one bit at a time, or a core that uh, processes two bits, four bits, or eight bits at a time. And we refer to that as the chunk size. So this is the internal serialization that we have. And we want to have abstraction. And this is a bit contradictory to what Surf does. We don't want to hand optimize at the gate level. We want to uh, go a bit up in, in abstraction to have more readable code, more maintainable code, and give the synthesis tools more degrees of freedom. And we want to have variants. So um, the first line here is variants in terms of feature sets. So we have a minimum variant. This is where you don't have any interrupts, but you really want to bring down the area. And there are two more variants work in progress, which is an interrupt variant where you have minimal interrupt support. So for example, you can only set the, the, uh, the jump targets on interrupts at synthesis time. And then there's one more variant, which is we call CSR, which gives you even more um, of the features that you uh, know of. And then we have variants in terms of your target technology. So just to give you one example, if your uh, target technology does not have dual board uh, block RAM available natively, you can implement the core with single port uh, block RAM and read the operands sequentially by the cost of one additional clock cycle. 
Let me now give you some insights. And here you can see the block diagram. I would say at first glance it looks pretty standard, but let me highlight some things. First off, you have an instruction in the data memory interface. So this is 32 bits wide. So from the outside world, it looks as, as an RV32i core. Um, then you have a program counter that addresses your instruction memory. Once you loaded the instruction, it is fed into decoders. So pretty standard there. Uh, but here it gets a bit special. When you say you want to load from data memory, you uh, need to parallelize the address first because you, uh, before you can make the load. And this is done in this SBMA register here. And then once you loaded the data, you need to serialize it for internal processing. And all that is done in this SBMD register. And I will come to it again a bit later on. And when you store data, by the way, you have it serially internally and you need to parallelize it for stores. Then you have a register file. Um, the X registers can be implemented in either block RAM or in distributed RAM. Uh, sorry, uh, for the CSRs, it's a bit special. Some can be included in the, in the block RAM, some cannot because of some parallel write issues. So some need to be uh, implemented in distributed RAM. So what did we achieve? Uh, here you can see a um, similar plot to the first one. So on the x-axis is the area, on the y-axis is the normalized performance. Again, we have an SOC bill up here with uh, the core. It's, uh, so the number is basically the chunk size. So here's a bit serial implementation. Here you have two bits at a time. Here you have four and eight. Then the D stands for that we uh, implement the register file with tool port block RAM. And this B stands for another uh, pi passing multiplex that we implemented to speed up things. You can see how the performance scales. So the one bit version is the slowest and it gets faster and faster, but it also consumes more area. Um, here you can see a zoomed out version of, of, the, of the big uh, diagram. And when we bring in the reference points, you can see how does it relate to cores that are out there. So there is a comparison to surf, uh, then to the same SOC with uh, curve, and uh, far out is uh, the, the SOC with the peak RV. And now you might say, well, we wanted to close the gap. We wanted to provide variance in between. Did we actually do that? And for that reason, you also need to take a look at the, the performance, so basically the, uh, the y-axis. And we definitely uh, brought down the gap before you need to uh, make that jump to the next bigger core. So you're much closer in terms of performance before you need to hop to the next uh, bigger core uh, from them that are out there. Uh, how does it look for other architectures? So you uh, can see them here. It's the first one was for, ECB, uh, for an IS-40, sorry. Um, then you have the data for an ECB5, for a GoWind little b, for uh, MD7 series. This is especially interesting. And then we have uh, the data for a uh, Cologne chip gate mate. And I've just said before that uh, we have variants. So let me just throw in another variant. And you can see it here. Uh, it's too much data to go into it now. But if you're interested, all that is in the publication. As I said, it's uh, freely available. So now you might ask, we have a 1-bit variant, we have a 2-bit variant, we have a 4-bit and an 8-bit. The next natural choice would be a 16-bit variant or even a 32-bit variant. So why didn't we do that? And the answer here is shifts and also sign and uh, zero extension. And to explain that, I need to go into a bit of detail and show you how we implemented shifts. And let me first show you a naive approach and say we have a 1-bit variant, we want to shift. And we have a register there. We have some data in it. And then we want to perform shifts. And say we perform all the shifts by cyclically shifting to the right. So then we can also shift uh, to the left by just shifting more to the right. So we take one bit, we shift. Say we want to uh, perform a shift by five to the right. So we have five single bit shifts. And once we're at the right position, we just shift out the data. This is fine, but the problem is it does not scale. So when we go to a 4-bit version, for example, and we perform single-bit shifts, we lose performance. So we need to be a bit more clever. Shifting by one bit, as said, is not efficient for larger chunk sizes. But on the other side, a barrel shifter is just too expensive. It, it is not justifiable to make a bit serial core and then have a barrel shifter. That uh, it gives uh, simply too much overhead. So for that, let me introduce macro steps. This is how we actually implemented it. And for that, let me bring in that same register again, but we make it a chunk size bigger than it actually needs to be. And with that, 
we can basically shift by this natural amount, so this internal degree of serialization. Say we have a four-bit core, then we shift four bits at a time. Now you might ask, what if we want to shift five bits? How unfortunate. And for that, we have a small barrel shift at the output. So you get to approximately the right position, and then the micro steps are done by just the multiplexers here. And the good thing is that the area of the register scales with the chunk size, but also the area of that multiplexer scale with the chunk size. And the performance scales with, with the chunk size. So this is what we really want to achieve. But this uh, multiplexer here gets really big once you go beyond 8 bits. This is the, one of the reasons why we stopped at 8 bits, but there is a second reason. And this is sign extension. When we go to a maximum of 8 bits, it's really convenient that that bit that we need to replicate for the sign extension is always at that position. So it's always the MSP, uh, MSP of that um, additional part here. But this only goes well up to a chunk size of 8 bits. And this is the other part of the answer why we stopped at 8 bits. And then you might ask, what else uh, did we do or did we achieve? And we have a tiny tape out. It's on tiny tape out 6 with an SOC called uh, Fezzi RV ExoTiny. It's a 2-bit variant of it. It's implemented in four tiles, but most of it is a just register file because we have um, um, flip-flops as um, X registers. Now you might also ask, why it is, is it called ExoTiny? And this is because we don't have any memory included in the table itself, but we have this uh, quad SBI interface that uh, you can have external RAM, external ROM, and once you make an access to memory, it gets translated into quad SBI, makes that access, and once you have the data, you acknowledge back to the processor. Um, this is the chip, by the way. I said it's four uh, tiles. Uh, it's currently under manufacturing, hopefully. Uh, it's back soon. I'm looking forward to that. And um, yeah, you might also ask, what uh, do we do next? What are open points? And there are quite some. Unfortunately, time is very limited, but gladly students are looking into the first uh, two points uh, currently. And this is a customer instruction interface, which is uh, very convenient to have that to speed up things to have internal serialization, but uh, can perform uh, important instructions also in hardware, so important um, um, steps that you need for your application. We also want to optimize the decoder even further. And then these two variants that I said, this interrupt variant and CSR variant, uh, need um, privileged ISA. So this is also an open point. And especially, and I've uh, written that here, is the verification framework for that. Not that our current verification framework is bad. We currently use RISCOV and a RISCOV formal. But once we go to privileged ISA, we somehow, in, in favor for area, need to a bit deviate from the specification. And your verification framework needs to be aware of that. Do not give you any false positives. And there's an, um, one of the open points is uh, CSRs. So this uh, CSR read-write instruction, we currently have that. But we don't have the immediate version of it because we have some collision in hardware. And there again is the question, do you want really to invest more hardware to have these uh, CSR read-write immediates? Or do you not implement it to bring down the area and your developer needs, aware, uh, needs to be aware of that? And in, if you're interested in contributing uh, to Fuzzy RV, feel free to give it a try. It's also uh, integrated into Litex. If you have some issues, feel free to um, contact me. Feel also free to open some issues on GitHub. So I'm uh, glad to help out there. Um, you will also see, if you want to contribute or try it out, that we have some workflows integrated into the repository. So when you fork it, one, for example, is this overview of the size of the core. So when you make a change and commit, then the size will automatically be evaluated and uh, recommitted into the repository with that chart. So on every change and every commit, you will directly see what was the effect of that. And now, finally, you might wonder, uh, what is this name? Why do you pronounce it like Fezzi RV? What is it all about? And uh, I have... Little of time left, so anyone has an, an idea what this means. There are two, at least two unofficial meanings of that, but let us stick to the official one for now. Any ideas? Okay, so we have four scalability options. As said before, one bit, two bit, uh, four bits, or eight bits, and we wanted to somehow express that in the name. And let me now go to the second slide, or to the next slide, and you will see where the name comes from. 
And TRV, of course, comes from uh, RISC-V. But maybe the inofficial meanings of that are a bit funnier, but I will come to that after the talk. Okay, uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Any question from non-organizers? <laughs> Very cool. Um, you in the performance plots. Mm -hmm. You seem. I think you were faster than serve for the ice forty, and you had quite a nice scale. Uh, but then for the other FPGAs, it varied a lot. So on one of them, I think you had. So let me go back. So you mean that? Uh, the previous one is easier, I think. Previous. Okay. Uh, oh no, the next one, but not the full one. This one. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So. On easy P5, for example, your one bit version is slow, larger than your two bit version. So here the one bit version, so this one? Uh, the ECB5. ECB5, yes. F1 is slightly sl larger than F2. Do you know why? It, I don't know why yet, but this is very good observation. I also noticed uh, that I haven't looked into it. It's synthesized uh, with Yosis. Uh, maybe it's some in, in, inference stuff. I don't really know yet why. But it's, it only happened, if I'm not mistaken, to the ECB5. But yeah. this it's is. Also, uh, it's also a 7 series. It's also 7 series, right. Right. I mean. But only, not with the DB. With, with the DB, 7 series is still faster. It, so. there, there it makes sense. I mean, you have native uh, tool port block room available here. So when you go for single port, you have some overhead for in the state machine. So that makes sense. But uh, this I can't explain currently. But it, it is something we want to look into. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? It seems like it's just for amusing you, <laughs> the entire conference. Uh, so does minimal implement traps? No. The, do you believe if you don't support traps that you are RISC-V compliant? Yeah. It's, it, it should be. I mean, for for example, the LiteX BIOS does not boot because it, it, it depends on traps to find the end of the memory to figure out how large the memory is. So if you don't trap, it will just, it will not finish booting. Okay. Uh, right. I think that's optional, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. I have a quick comment and a question. The comment is, with this whole like field of like doing a super small core, I would have thought you would consider the entire resource usage to like implement something on the FPGA. So you've not only got LUTs, but the RAM as well to like have the instructions in. So therefore, I would have thought I wouldn't even bother doing any of this without including the compressed instruction set. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my comment. And my question is, um, what are the uses of these cores? Like, I think they're really cool, and, and like in my head, I can think of some use cases. But where do you see them get used? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, everywhere where you really have pressure on areas, so maybe smart sensors, or as I said before, you may have a project, but you need a very tiny core just for some debugging purposes. And without eating away too much area, you can just throw it in there, have it do your debugging stuff, and then maybe take it out again. Or for the sensors mentioned before, where you really want to produce a tiny chip and you have no pressure on performance. Yeah. And maybe all of those some additional use cases, because I assume it's very similar to SIR. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, DDR initialization is one thing. Like You put uh, CPU in that's only used for like a couple of milliseconds, and then it doesn't do anything. There are a couple of use cases. I have some in my previous presentations. but. Uh, to my question. So, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I, I recognize yeah. a lot of, of the challenges and I, uh, that you have, uh, and very familiar. Also, for serve is a bit of a problem because the 32-bit version would be a parallel serve. That would be perv. So I'm not sure uh, <laughs> if you want that. Yeah. But uh, my question is about the custom instructions. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, both um, uh, Vexrisk and, and serve uh, is, is looking at using the uh, custom. What's it called now? Custom extensions. I don't remember the name either. See if you, yeah. Uh, do you, are you looking at the custom custom instruction interface, or are you looking at the one we are trying to uh, mainline into uh, the Risk Five specs now? Um, basically, CX. Yeah, yeah, composable extensions. Yeah. 
Um, we're currently evaluating. It's really that we don't want to introduce too much area overhead there. And also with a bit serial risk five core for your custom instructions, you need to somehow make sure that it works out because also when you go through bit by bit, also it, it ends up to custom instructions in, in this order and that may cause some conflict. But I can't give an answer currently because we're really evaluating what we want to do there in the future to have it uh, working, to have it beneficial without introducing too much area overhead again. Yeah, well, I would be glad to do so. You want to take it over? <laughs> <laughs> you have to compete, not to collaborate. So, thank you very much. Uh, any other question? Let's thank Maynard again. Thank you. So the last presenter of the first session is already getting here. You do the wiring.